and good morning, Art 116, Wednesday morning, week nine. We're trying to figure out how to wind up this quarter, and I think I've got a good one for you. Um, the last project that I want to do with the class deals with the idea of subjective color. And your authors introduced this idea of subjective color late in chapter seven. And so I wanna revisit that today. I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation so that we can take a little bit of a deep dive into subjective color, cause it's fun. And of all the color schemes that you can come up with as a painter or as a designer, um, you know, subjective color is fun. Um, it doesn't have any rules, except that it sort of does have a couple of rules that are, make it a little bit more helpful. And I'm going to kind of like um, <clears throat> softly suggest those rules to you so that it will help you because I am from the government and I'm here to help. And that's true. So morning section, how you all doing today? There's Emily right there. And Kelsey's here. And Adriel is right up there. And Jordan is here. I can just find these people on my list. Riley, okay. Five people, five people checked in. That's fantastic. So let me talk a little bit about subjective color today. Um, I'm gonna run over to the PowerPoint presentation and do that on a, chair, on a share screen. And so there's going to be a slight little death by PowerPoint here for the next couple of minutes, which I hope you will be able to deal with as we kind of move forward. So we're in chapter seven. We're at the end of chapter seven. So talking about subjective color. So this kind of color is what um, a lot of the modern age has been dealing with ever since the turn of the 20th century uh, for most of the 20th and 21st century, we have now have the option to do subjective color in a composition as painters, but also in photography, in design, um, anywhere where it is appropriate and where it would work for you and your client. So this is important to think about. Subjective color is not color from your direct observation of reality. So when you look around the room or you look in the mirror and you see that the colors are reflected back to you, uh, and that is direct observation. You're uh, directly observing the colors that you see in the world. Subjective color is not that. It's something different. So subjective color uh, for bullet point number two is color that comes from the artist's imagination. Um, <clears throat> usually I have, from what I've been able to see, um, I am uh, characterizing it as unnatural, jarring color harmonies that are different, that you've never seen before, um, that are off-putting or that are unexpected. So, um, and we're gonna look at some modern mo painting movements that have used subjective color. And those include a very short-lived uh, movement called Fauvism, which only lasted for a year or two, 1905 to six. Um, expressionism, which back in my day used to be called German Expressionism, 1917 to about 1920, and Cubism, and finally pop art in the 1960s, all played around with subjective color, or at least they had adherents, leaders in those movements that kind of really had a good time with and became known for their use of subjective color. So let's jump right in there, shall we? All right. <clears throat> so at the beginning of the 20th century, we have you know, and this is art history, um, two major people um, who are kind of like the driving forces of modernism, of abstraction and modernism in the 20th century. And they are Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse. And so we're gonna look at Matisse right now because Matisse was more about color and playing with color in modern kind of ways, while Picasso was more about form. You know, he and others um, popularized the idea of cubism and um, those kinds of approaches to abstract form in painting. But Matisse was more interested in playing with different kinds of color and colors that are not necessarily observed directly from reality. 
So this is a painting of his wife and it's called Madame Matisse, but it also has the, um, the, um, the nickname, the green line, because of that kind of green vertical line that goes through the middle of the face of his wife. Now, so this is painted in 1905, and this was just radical, crazy painting uh, for people to look at and try to appreciate in 1905. Traditional painting still was um, um, holding sway in much of uh, the art establishment and art circles, although there were people in the avant-garde. The avant-garde is French for the cutting edge. Um, they are the advanced troops, the shock troops that go in first, and uh, then the rest of the army comes in behind. So the avant-garde among the artists were those who were playing with um, abstraction. Matisse and uh, uh, several others were playing with abstraction in terms of color and trying to use colors that were not natural and that were kind of very much simplified and playing a, those around with simplified forms and different kinds of brush strokes and that kind of stuff. But color was the main thing among Matisse and this first movement, which were the Faubes. Um, let's look at Madame Matisse for just a second here. Over on the right-hand side, if you guys can see my cursor, and I hope that you can, we have kind of a peachy uh, bunch of brush strokes that are a little bit coarser brush strokes where you see brush strokes where there's some white and some peach color and some other somewhat neutralized colors kind of uh, being applied wet in wet and very loosely blended. Over on the left side, we see this um, yellow green area of flesh tone over here, and it's a little bit more fully blended. So we get two different kinds of flesh tones here. And sometimes people are looking these at these as the lit portion of the composition and the shaded portion of the composition. But you can see also that there are, are highlights on both sides of the composition that don't really mean that we have a lit side and a shaded side. And then in this strange middle area, there's this place where the, um, uh, yellow green is kind of blended over the top of the blue, the blue that is used in the eyes and in the eyebrows, and then up here in the hair helmet uh, that is up here on her head, we have a little bit of that blue kind of pulled in to this central vertical area that is the middle of the forehead and the bridge of the nose, and then some of this yellow green kind of blended over across the top of it, and then it, it continues down through the bridge of the nose into the upper lip and then a little bit into the chin down here. Um, and even down, it still gets pulled down here just a little bit further. So, you know, the, the yellow green plus blue gives us sort of a, a greenish kind of tint to this central portion here. Now, this is not the only thing Matisse is doing. The, the background is really strange. He's chosen some very strange colors, some colors being bright and some colors being neutralized. Let's look at the bright colors. Um, this orange red that is off uh, on the left side below the ear here is a really strong color and it gets repeated down here in the bodice of her dress, especially in these kind of folds here, kind of around the neckline a little bit. And we see a little bit of it boop, right up here in the hairline and a little bit over here, boop, a little bit over here defining the, the transition between the cheekbone and the right ear over here her left ear, our right ear. Okay, going up here into this upper left-hand corner, we see a red violet. And the red violet is mixed with a lot of white. So it's, it's a little bit more neutralized. It's not quite as strong, except what's way out here at the outside edge is a bit stronger. You guys have to remember neutralization of color in this. Adding white or adding black, or adding a little bit of its, uh, another color, including its complement, will neutralize a color. So when we come back down here into the shoulders and the bodice of the garment that she's wearing, a little bit of this has been drugged down here and mixed in over here on the left shoulder. Okay, that's kind of fun. Let's go over here to the right side of the composition and we see this, this kind of blue-green area with a lot of white mixed into it to make a tint of blue-green over here. And then as we get around this shaded area, uh, around the shoulder and the face, 
the 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 uh, blue that's being played with in the hair is kind of drug in here and then blended out into this blue green area that has a lot of white mixed in with it. Well, this area of the background gets pulled into the collar of her dress, and then some would argue it also gets pulled in in some places into um, the face. I'm not seeing it very much, but this is a blue green and this is a yellow green, and there's a lot of um, uh, close, you know, uh, uh, the, the word escapes me for a moment, but um, analogous colors, colors that appear close to each other on the color wheel, if not exactly next to each other on the color wheel, they're kind of analogous colors. And so there's a little bit echoing back and forth between the um, yellow green on this side of the face and then the blue green over here that is um, has a lot of white mixed into it to make a tint of blue green over here. Anyway, what we're seeing here is color that is not uh, from, you know, observed directly from uh, nature. And he's not tr even trying to be super naturalistic with his color. Um, the blue hair, I mean, come on. He has decided that his wife's black hair or dark brown hair is going to have this is going to be replaced by this color blue here. And so we get this really dark, either cobalt or Prussian blue that's being used up here in the hair. And then for the, um, the contour lines around the shoulders, around the, uh, um, the collar of the dress, contour lines that are kind of defining the eyes, the eye shapes and the blue inside the eyes, the contours that are gonna try to define some um, aspects of the face. All of these contours are blue. So he's not using black to, for the most part. And, you know, he's not using anything that would be an observed color. He's playing with us with all of these different colors and trying to find some balances in here between neutralized colors and full spectrum intensity colors. Neutralized colors that are warm and full spectrum intensity colors that are cool. And so he's just kind of play, 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 playing around and really having fun with us. Keep that in mind. Um, subjective color is a lot about playing with color. And so you're really gonna to have to uncork um, that uh, pent up child that we have with the childlike creativity that we've had, most of us have had beaten out of us over the last you know 10 years of um, organized um, education and growing up and uh, trying to conform to what other people are thinking and, and that kind of thing. And this is non-conformity here. This is trying to be very playful. So we're going to have to try to get um, uh, it back in touch with our inner child when we're playing with these colors. Um, here's another one by Henri Matisse, woman with a hat. Um, it's a lot more of an elaborate painting. We have many more color shapes that are breaking up the background a little bit. We've got lemon yellow and this blue green uh, uh, tinted with white that we've seen before and the, and the blue over here, uh, the blue green again up here, um, the um, violet, uh, red violet over here. And then we can see some of those violets and oranges and stuff in the lower half of the composition. And when you know you uncork a red violet up here and then repeat it down here in her sleeve or somewhere in the dress or the fan that she's holding, that's a great way of helping to unify the composition by taking a color that you see in one part of the composition and bringing it down to another part and kind of distributing those colors it kind of helps to unify what otherwise would be a crazy quilt of ununified colors. The yellow out here by her head in the background is brought in as a highlight for the cheekbone, this part of the upper lip here, and the, and the tip of her nose right here. These blues that are just kind of thrown in here as shadows in the face are also found in the fan, oops, and in the background and in other places in the composition. So he is 
doing a painterly trick that you guys haven't maybe learned yet as painters, but you, when you use a color, you have to use it in several places in the composition, distributing it around. That kind of helps to create with a certain sense of organic balance in the composition and a, uh, helps to bring a, about a, an organic unity in the composition too. Anyway, we've got all kinds of crazy colors in her face and crazy colors in the background and within you know, the hat and the fan, uh, kind of a Japanese uh, oriental fan, which was all the rage you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and her dress. So keep in mind this playful use of color as we're moving forward. Um, here's something that um, is the joy of life, joie de vivre. Uh, Matisse was, this is one of his themes, um, throughout his work, um, the idea of bathers, um, you know, bathers is the artistic um, uh, justification for being able to paint nudes. And so we have these bathers kind of hanging out here on a beach. Um, they're kind of all happily, joyfully cavorting with each other. Um, we've got somebody just posing over here and another person kind of squatting down, picking flowers and a couple over here kind of embracing and whatnot. We've got people uh, doing Ring Around the Rosie here in a dance, a joyful dance, uh, all nude, and it's all wonderful and everything else. Other couples and uh, individual people that are nudes and semi-nudes in the composition. But wait a minute, let's, let's look at these people in the foreground here. They've got a lot of um, that red to red-violet going on. And so some really strangely um, colored nude people in the foreground. Um, if you are Caucasian and you think that Caucasian flesh tones are a natural, normal flesh tone, then these two figures in the center are pretty much nailing that down for us. But they are laying in the shade, and then the shade kind of opens up to this sandy beach out here, which then um, opens up onto the ocean in the background. And look at the color of the sand on this beach. It is a bright lemon yellow color out here. The ocean is violet with a little bit of um, red violet or uh, some kind of reddish color uh, neutralized with a little white mixed into it. Um, the sky uh, from the horizon going upwards is a kind of a pink. And there's a lot of white mixed in with the red to create a pinkish sky. Back here in the shade of all of these trees, we've got crazy trees. The trees, the foliage on the trees is orange and there's a uh, reddish pink over here. There are greens and the greens have been somewhat neutralized with a lot of white mixed in with them. There are some browns that are kind of worked in here, some brown shapes that break up some of these orange and red orange kinds of shapes. But the trees and the shade that they cast here in the foreground for all of these folks who are kind of hanging out in the shade is a very strange light and a very strange color combination. And the only way these things work is by taking some of these colors and using them up in the upper register, way up here in the foliage, and then repeating it down here in the bodies of some of these reclining figures that are down here. And the same thing left to right, we've got some of this orange over here and some of the orange up here. Um, and then much, a lot of these colors are also somewhat neutralized and repeated in the bodies of all of these happy little figures that are cavorting around, having a good time expressing the joy of life. <clears throat> oh my gosh. So uh, Matisse and a couple other painters um, all had an exhibit in 1905. And it was in a small gallery that also had a, a statue in the center of the gallery. It was kind of on permanent display by Donatello, one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but more importantly, one of the early sculptors of the Italian Renaissance. So this 400 year old bronze sculpture was in the middle of this gallery. And on all of these crazy <clears throat> modernist color paintings were all around the outside uh, walls of the gallery, hanging on the wall. So that when a uh, reviewer came in to review the show, an art critic wrote down that, you know, poor Donatello, he's surrounded by all these wild beasts, these wild animals that were all hanging on the walls, referring to the paintings. 
And in French, the word wild beasts or, or the phrase wild beast uh, translates into fauves. The wild animals, the wild beasts were the fauves. And so the fauves, fauvism was this very short-lived movement that happened in 1905, 1906. And Andre de Rain was part of that movement. <clears throat> and de Rain um, painted a lot more, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, landscape paintings than um, still life paintings. And so here's the Turning Road, which uh, is a famous Durain painting, which is in all of the art history books and um, in many uh, editions of our um, design text. And so this is supposed to be um, <clears throat> a uh, city park in which we have a bunch of big trees in the foreground and they're deciduous trees with foliage leaves uh, on top. We've got a pine tree over here in the central left portion, but this pine tree is like no other pine tree you've ever seen before because, because even though it has kind of a pine tree shape to it, it's almost on fire. The uh, central trunk of the pine tree is visible and all of the lit portion of the pine tree over on this side is, is really lit. Um, <clears throat> it's not just that doesn't just have um, bright light uh, shining on it, but the bright light is actually the color of the boughs and the branches and the foliage of this tree. So we've got yellows and some yellow greens in here. We've got some oranges and even some red violets in, in the middle of this freaking pine tree with a little bit of green around the edges to kind of help it out. And as we look at the tree canopies that are more in the middle ground and background, the tree canopies over here are um, red, orange, violets. There are some yellows and greens all kind of worked around in all of this stuff. This tree canopy way in the background across the road and across uh, from where we are, the tree canopies are all kind of together and blended together with lots of blues, um, medium blues, dark blues, and then we've got this beautiful kind of yellow, yellow, orange stripe across the top that gives us a sense of sunlight um, hitting the tops of these tree canopies over here. The uh, tree trunks are just amazing. Tree trunks that are red oranges to have a whoops, some oranges in them. I clicked inadvertently there. But we've, we transition into blues in the same tree trunk. The tree trunks are just crazy. And so with all of this sense of crazy color, we actually have relatively naturalistic forms in this painting. It's just that the colors have been totally uncorked. But you can kind of see that when you're using these colors and um, repeating the use of those colors in other areas of the composition to help balance things top to bottom, left to right, and on the diagonals, that still helps to pull this composition together in terms of color balances throughout the composition. So Durain went as crazy as possible and is still kind of holding it together. Now I want to show you a little trick that he used. In all of these things that he's interested in, he's using fairly full spectrum intensity colors and then just painting and blending them together without any additional um, white mixed in as a tint. Let's look in the far background, up in the sky between all these tree branches in the background. Backgrounds are important, ladies and gentlemen, and you have to pay as much attention to the backgrounds as what's going on in the foregrounds. And, and in between all of these trees, we've got tints of all of these colors. So he's mixing lots of white in with these yellow greens and greens and um, blues and blue violets. And then he's kind of working all of that into a neutralized value that is the sky or the extreme uh, distance. And so we, we learned yesterday or on Monday that neutralized colors tend to recede from the viewer while bright full spectrum intensity colors tend to advance towards the color and warm colors tend to advance towards the viewer more than cool colors. Well, here it is uh, being displayed to us in a, um, in a fauvistic kind of a way with crazy colors, which with um, colors that come out of the artist's imagination, um, we get color, but he's also using some of that idea of plastic colors so that the warm colors are advancing towards us and the cool, strong colors are strong 
but they're kind of maintaining their own in the meat in the middle ground and in the background. But in the far background, we have neutralized colors that are really able to push back and open up the illusionistic three dimensional space. Even if, even if it's not a naturalistic illusion, it's still an illusionistic three dimensional space that we get to sen we, we get to experience the sense of a landscape with depth in it. Pretty cool. Um, Durain did a bunch of other landscapes, uh, lots of coastal scenes, the south coast of France. And so we get the same kind of uh, almost unnatural uses of colors here. Um, and some of this is kind of reminiscent of what Van Gogh was doing, the short choppy brush strokes in the foreground. But um, some of these colors may be naturalistic, like maybe red tile rooftops on um, buildings that are clustered around a seascape, cityscape area on the coast. But we've also got these fields back here. And this might be um, mature, uh, ripe grain ready for harvest. But really, I've never seen wheat that was red and orange, as well as yellow and, and orange in color. And so he, he's taking some liberties with color here in 1906. Um, Let's skip ahead for a minute. We're going to skip all the way up to the um, uh, the pop art scene in the 1960s. And Andy Warhol was kind of one of the most one of the baddest boys, one of the most famous people, one of the most infamous artists of the pop art scene in the 1960s. And the things that he was trafficking in mostly were the idea of American icons and American celebrity. So he would either play with, you know, the Camel Soup can or, you know, other kind of, you know, famous American icons that were part of American manufacturing and American advertising and that kind of stuff. Or the images of celebrities, either from movies or from their, um, their uh, celebrity fan still photos that they would give out, stuff like that. And so Marilyn Monroe uh, was, an icon of the silver screen from a lot of her movies from the 1950s and six, early 60s. And she was, I think she, Marilyn Monroe died of a drug overdose in 1963. And so um, here we've got uh, Andy playing with Marilyn in, at the peak of her, um, at the height of her fame and everything, Marilyn Monroe, 1962. Now this isn't a painting. This is a silk screen. That's a color silk screen. So he's using a stock photograph of her and then breaking it up into different shape colors that he can silk screen onto paper or onto a canvas. And so the photographic um, portion of this um, are all of the textures. And the textures are kind of reduced down to just something that's very graphic that gives us a sense of the shadows in her hair and the textures of her hair, the shadows around her eyes and the textures of her eye makeup and eyebrows, the shadows underneath her nose, the tip of her nose and nostrils, and the texture around her lips are all done in black. And so black is one color silk screen that has been screened on top of here. And I think it was the last color screened on here. The first colors probably were the background color, which is kind of a post office green. It is a blue green that has a lot of white mixed into it. So it's a super neutralized green that sits in the background and kind of recedes into the background, but it also is, is that nauseating kind of industrial um, institutional green that was in, in um, hallways and lobbies of post offices and hospitals a lot in the 1950s and 60s. Um, the color of her eyeshadow is kind of a light blue. Again, it's a blue mixed with a white to make a, a really high tint of blue. And we see that used in the collar of her dress, although maybe that's a little bit darker blue or blue green in the collar of her dress. And again, the color that is kind of the sparkly stuff of her diamond earrings, um, just kind of creeping out of the creepy uh, shadows of the bottom of her hair is that same color. So that color has been a different color and it's been silk screened in. Then we've got the color of her face, which is a pink, just a solid pink that's with silk screen on. 
and the color of her lips, which is just this bright, you know, strong red, and then the black, uh, all of the photographic, somewhat um, simplified shadows and textures of a uh, kind of a graphic photograph, uh, silk screened over the top. So this is our first Maryland to consider. This is, you know, um, not natural. She was known as a bleach blonde, but this is not, you know, a bleach blonde color. This is lemon yellow used in the hair. And she was a, you know, Caucasian, you know, American woman, but, you know, that Caucasian is now simplified to just pink, you know, just one nasty pink color. The lips are, um, almost a blood red. And of course, that, that really bright red lipstick was a popular shade in the early 1950s, late 1940s. Um, but it's a little bit scary. It's also, it kind of makes her uh, uh, ominous and scary a little bit. So it's kind of interesting how these colors are working together. Some colors are neutralized, like the pink of her face and the, and the light green background are very neutralized colors. And you know, large areas of neutral colors, especially neutralized with white, tend to help um, harmonize this composition quite a bit. The strong colors like the yellow and the red are used to a lesser degree. They're used to highlight certain areas and make them pop um, in stark contrast with the neutralized uh, background. So remember, I keep telling you guys, remember to use neutralized colors because they're super important in making your compositions actually work and being able to you know, see what's going on in the composition long enough so that you don't turn off your viewer. Um, Warhol did a whole series of these. And so he's playing with all the different colors in the background, foreground, um, in the hair, in the flesh tones, and in the lips. And so this is a variation on that tone. This is a little bit more monstrous than the first one because now she's got blue eyes. In fact, she's got blue in the whites of her eyes, which is really strange to look at. And still kind of an orange red set of lips and still that yellow hair. But now her flesh tone is a high key violet color, violet to red violet. And I mean, really, is that a natural flesh tone of any kind. We have a somewhat neutralized orange in the background. So we, we are really playing with weird color here. And now he's getting crazy on us. So now he's taking the same colors that he's used before, but, but moving them around a little bit. So pink in the background and neutralized blue for the, for the facial uh, flesh tones. The um, uh, shadows are all done in this um, strange green color, this kind of acid green color that's kind of a, um, gosh, what is this green? It's green, but it has a little bit of yellow in it, uh, not too much yellow, and it's just a very strange green. We, he's using the same pink for her eyelids as he's using in the background, and then red for the lips, uh, but also um, the collar of her dress and the kind of the highlights that are in the diamond earrings underneath uh, in the shadows on either side of her head. It just becomes scarier and eerier. And then we can see just a little hint of orange in her eyeballs. And that kind of picks up with the orange that's happening in the hair too. This is not done by mistake. This is done on purpose to be more and more ghastly and monstrous because you're taking this sex symbol this symbol of beauty and sensuality from American cinema and playing with the idea of what can you do with the colors of it to make it as ugly or as different or, uh, you know, and what are those tensions that are happening in here between the, the shapes of Marilyn Monroe's face and the colors that are being applied to it. It's a fantastic, you know, interesting, strange um, thing that Warhol is doing with these. So, and now another thing that Warhol does are his multiples. And he did this with Campbell soup cans and Coke bottles and SOS and Brillo pads and other kinds of things. And it goes back to American manufacturing because if one item is good, 
then uh, uh, four of them or 10 of them or a million of them are even better because we can roll them right off of an assembly line. We can mass market them to the public and we can sell them to people. And so here we are with four Maryland's from 1967. And so we've got some that are somewhat naturalistic like the one in the upper right hand corner which is not, is not really naturalistic, but it's as natural as you're gonna get and when you start to uh, compare it to the other ones. The one in the lower left-hand corner is somewhat naturalistic and representational. And then the, the one in the upper left and the lower right are almost like um, some kind of strange photographic negative you know, of Marilyn. And when you look at these, they go from being you know, about beauty and, and uh, the beauty icon to being almost monsters, almost like the Wolfman from the old, you know, 1930s Wolfman movies. And so, you know, the same shapes that we see in the, uh, in the beauty icon, when just having different colors applied to them can become quite monstrous in comparison. And so we got the four Maryland's here. And if that isn't enough, you know, there's nine Maryland's and the, the, the idea of posterizing these things and creating them as kind of poster art using silkscreen as a mass production um, method for uh, throwing color onto these things is part of the Warhol shtick. And he has many other artists in, in his employ working for him, usually for slave wages or for drugs or no money. Um, at his studio in, um, in New York that he calls the factory. And the factory just churns out art, um, mass produced, uh, that he sells in galleries and makes a lot of money off of because he's making these outrageous and crazy posterized kinds of approaches to art. Okay, and that's about it. So I'm coming back to you guys now. So that was kind of a quick dive into the idea of um, let's see, where did I put that? Um, I'm looking now for the thing that I was supposed to get, but I don't have. Ah, okay. Um, uh, subjective art. And so the idea that I have that I want to start to distribute to you guys is that you're going to do a subjective art painting. And so I have these line drawings, just like the apples that I did with the Cezanne drawings. I have these line drawings. Here's Andre Durain's um, uh, The Turning Road. This is a landscape, horizontal composition, landscape um, painting. And so I'm going to be printing these out on um, cardstock and putting them outside on my table for you guys to pick up and you have your choice of which one of these you'd like to do we have a landscape andre Durain landscape and we have a maryland um andy warhol's maryland monroe and again all you get is the line drawing so you're going to have to be creating your set of imaginary colors, subjective colors from your imagination. And this is where I would highly recommend that you can, you can use as many colors as you want. You can choose them at random from the um, color wheel, but I would strongly recommend that you use at least um, some neutralized colors, neutralized with white, to be able to make these things a little bit easier to look at. A neutralized color um, creates way better color harmonies than strong clashing full spectrum intensity colors and especially darker colors. So that's something to think about. Um, I've got um, Henri Matisse's um, Madame Matisse, the green line. That's another one that's possible. And I'm gonna come up with some more, but these are the ones that I've got right now that are gonna be available starting today. And I'll, I'll crank out a couple more and uh, have some more examples of them up that I can share with you guys in another um, PowerPoint presentation, perhaps on Friday. Your last assignment, though, is going to be to do a painting <clears throat> using one of these templates, if you want to use a template. And also, you know, you can color outside the lines if you actually happen to be a painter, and you can paint your own painting. 
but it's going to be with subjective color, color that does not come from the observed reality in the real world, but from your imagination and using strange, crazy colors in a composition, sometimes jarring co colors and color harmonies to create a composition. And so I'm going to walk us through this, but I'm going to be, I've got about 50 of these, uh, 10, 10, and well, 15, 15, and 10 um, printed up already. And I'm going to put them out on my tabletop so that you can pick these up. I'm also going to have to like um, email these things out so that people who are remote distance from the college can print these out on their own computer printer on cardstock so that you can uh, also you know, choose which one you want to paint and to start painting this. This is going to be kind of a slow entry into this. This is our last project and we've got all of next week to work on it and half of this week to work on it. So this is kind of a slow, you know, pick these things up, start thinking about the idea of um, subjective color, review the concept of subjective color in our textbook in chapter seven, and we're going to ease ourselves into this as a painting project. Um, for this week and next. So having said all that, and, and I'm halfway losing my voice right now, if you can't tell, um, I'm gonna, probably gonna say goodbye to you guys for now. I'm gonna set those things out on the table for your avail availability to you to pick up. And you can pick those up and I'm gonna kind of create some more over the next couple of days. And then we're gonna ease ourselves into this. I'll probably do a painting demonstration on Friday and next Monday. I'll probably do a little bit more PowerPoint with some more examples of um, uh, subjective art next week, subjective color. But welcome to the crazy side <coughs> of painting and art, subjective color. It's our last project for um, basic design color theory. Um, I'm gonna say goodbye to, now, to you now before I lose my voice completely. Um, goodbye, and I'll see you guys again on Friday. Bye-bye for now.